that fast car drive there looked like, uh, <clears throat> kind of remind me of my wife's driving, but, uh, oh, man, well, <clears throat> I'm sorry, she's here, <laughs> you know, this morning. Um, Ephesians chapter 3 is our text this morning, so let's go ahead and, and turn in our Bibles to that. I want to quote you something that um, I hope it's not taken out of context, because I did read it in an article. Billy Graham once said, God cannot use a discouraged Christian. Well, is that true or not? And if so, what can we do about it? As we open up the Bible this morning, we understand that certainly discouraging times or really adversity can cause us great discouragement. In fact, it causes us sometimes to doubt uh, God because some of the things going on in your life today are real. They're true, just not the whole truth. It's not the only thing that's real. God's got something else out there. But nevertheless, they are real to you. And it's just like John the Baptist. John the Baptist was one of the most godly men that ever lived. And yet the Bible says, even though he stood there in the River Jordan and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world as Jesus got into the baptismal waters, a few years later, not too long after that, <clears throat> he was in prison. And he sent one of his disciples to ask Jesus the question, are you the Messiah or is there another one coming? Even John the Baptist, in the midst of suffering and adversity, began to doubt. And so Paul is writing this letter to the church at Ephesus, a really precious church to him. Precious in the fact that he had been there three and a half years of his ministry. And as he was there, he built relationships with them. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Acts, when he left the a church at Ephesus, they followed him to the shore and they hugged on him and they cried on his shoulder knowing that they may never see Paul again. And some people never did. Now, Paul had been in a prison in Rome for over three years. There because he preached the gospel. There because he said the Jews and Gentiles were no longer separate, but they're together now in one church, as we talked about last week. And so Paul, at this point, has been so exuberant, he's been so excited about everything. He's writing the church, and he just can't help but just write just as fast as he can. I think sometimes he just stops, drops his pen, and just starts jumping up and down. He says in the first chapter, Wow, you know, God has lavished his grace upon us. We've been adopted into his family. And then in the final part of chapter 1, he begins to pray for the church. He says the power of God comes through the church as a whole as well as the individual. Then in chapter 2, he elaborates on it by saying, look, you were, you were dead, you were doomed, you, you were despairing, but Jesus Christ, but now God has come along Jesus Christ has died on the cross for your sins. The Spirit of God has come to live inside your heart, for by grace you've been saved. He takes it, that grace of God, that lavish grace of, of God to us as individuals. But then, beginning in chapter 2, verse 11, he talks about the church as a whole. Now, as he talks about this, the Bible says in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Now, I don't know about your Bible, but mine, mine has a little line in there. Now, what are the translators trying to tell us? There's a pause here. Now, Paul is thinking to himself, hey, you know, I've been so excited. I've been talking about this and talking about that. I mean, just talking about the greatness of God and the grace of God. And he thinks to himself, you know, some of these people are discouraged. What are they discouraged about? Well, they're discouraged about what Paul's going through. Now, I don't know if he had somebody, a messenger there, from the church at Ephesus to tell him that. I don't know what the Holy Spirit told him that, but he pauses. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, in chapter 3, verse 1, this is actually a beginning of a prayer. He's praying for the church. And he picks up the prayer again in verse 14 when he says, for this reason again, I bow my knees before the Father. But he, now he pauses. It's like a, a parenthetical passage, like a, a rabbit chasing. He chases a rabbit here. And he says, you're discouraged for me. How do you know, pastor, that he's really dis they're discouraged for him? Look in verse 13 at the end of this passage. He says, therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations. They, they had lost heart. They were discouraged in their faith. Now, Paul in this passage really accomplishes two things. The idea was, hey, look, don't be discouraged for me because let me tell you how I have overcome discouragement in my own life, even though I'm in prison. He said, what I've done, you can do too. You can overcome that kind of discouragement in your own life. But in the meantime, as he's writing this, he elaborates 
on the church again and the Jews and Gentiles coming together and the purpose to it all and what's supposed to happen in the church as well. And so really, he's accomplishing these two things. So keep that in mind all throughout the passage as we look at this. But as we look at this, I got three things that Paul's done in his life and Paul has convinced himself of through the Holy Spirit of God on how to overcome discouragement in his life. Number one, he says we can overcome discouragement because we're looking at God uh, or life from God's perspective. Verse one, he says, for I, this reason, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now right there, that tells me something very, very important. He was actually the prisoner of Rome. He's a prisoner of Caesar, but he didn't consider himself the prisoner of Caesar. He says, I'm the prisoner of the Lord. That gives me a hint right off the bat on Paul's perspective as we're looking at all this. And he's saying that because I'm a prisoner, I'm putting Christ first in my life. He says, he goes on to say, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard for the stewardship of God's grace, which is given to me for you. Now he says, for this reason, verse one, what reason? Well, we've already talked about it, but verses 11 through 22 is what he's referring to. He says, look, I've already told you about this. In just a moment, he'll mention this again. I've already told you about briefly about the Jews and Gentiles coming together to form one church. And you remember he had the temple imagery here involved. He's saying, for example, there was an outer court for the Gentiles that anybody could go. Gentiles, of course, please keep in mind, is everybody else besides the Jews. Everybody could go outside the outer court. But then there was a barrier there. And unless you were a Jew, you could not enter into the inner court. So there's a wall there. There's a barrier there. And that's what he's referring to. And he says the barrier has come down from the Jews and the Gentiles. And now we've come together to form one church. And there lies the power of God. Ephesians 1, 19 through 22. And he says this. We are, we are a special people. And he goes on to describe it in verse 19. So we are no longer strangers and aliens. But you are fellow citizens. We've got a new king. And are of God's household. We've got a new father. Verse 21, in whom the whole building fitted together. We're one building. We're not just one block. We're one building fitted together, housing the fullness of God. He says, in whom we also being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Again, temple imagery. The temple of God is where, in the Old Testament, where Shekinah glory was. It's where the very presence of God was represented. If you go past the inner court and into the holy place, and then past that, there was a curtain there called the Holy of Holies, and behind that was the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, and that's where the presence of God was in Israel. And he says, look, it's the church now. It's the church individually, but also very significantly, corporately, together, particularly the local body of believers it's where God dwells among his people. He says, for this reason, I've written you this thing, these things. For this reason, I want to pray for you. Then he goes on to say, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship, now look, listen to this verse, of God's grace which was given to me for you. You know, this is one of the passages in Ephesians that is preached less on than any other passage, I think, in, in the book of Ephesians. And uh, rightly so, because people look at it and say, I don't, how can I understand all that? Because the stewardship, don't we, when we talk about stewardship, aren't we talking about money? I mean, right, I mean, that's just a code word in church, you know, for money. Well, no, it's not. Stewardship means I'm a manager. And I'm a manager of whatever God gives me. Now, notice he says, I'm a manager, strange way to put things. I'm a manager of the grace of God that's been given to me, he says, for you talking about the church at Ephesus, but also talking about everybody else that's going to hear the gospel message and, and, and his ministry. He says, I'm a manager of the grace that God has given to me. Now, Paul's already talked about God's grace. It's given to us and given to us and given to us and the grace of God. Now, when we think about the grace of God, we think about God just giving to us. What Paul's saying is here, I'm a manager of the grace that God's given me to give to everybody else. Now, we don't think that way. Now, this is very important. If you don't get anything else in the message uh, bless your heart, but nevertheless, you need to get this part, okay? Because we think about the great, when we talk about grace living and grace giving, grace service, we think, well, <clears throat> God's a forgiving God because when we think about grace, what do we think about most? We think about forgiveness. Sure we do. And we think about kindness. If somebody else is gracious to somebody else, we think, oh, they're being kind to, to you. They're being gracious to you. So we think about kindness, we think about forgiveness, but Paul's saying, look, you don't, Please don't stop there. 
He says, God's lavished his grace upon us. And Paul is even saying, I don't even understand all the grace of God. I'm still learning about the grace of God. He said, it's far beyond anything that I can understand. But knowing this, everything that we have, every gift, everything that we have that's good in our life is from the grace of God because it really means God's generosity, undeserved generosity toward us. And so God is given to us to give to others. Now, we don't look at grace that way. And if I can just take a... a an example from television for just a moment. Sometimes the way we look at God is the same way, it reminds me of The Bachelor on TV this year. I know, I'm guilty. <laughs> Some of you guys do watch that with your wives, right? Say amen. I mean, this is your chance. Don't embarrass yourself that way. Don't, don't say amen. No, but anyway, the guy of The Bachelor this year called, I think, Juan or Quan or something, Juan Pablo. Okay, and real debonair guy, and uh, you know he's he's Spanish, Venezuelan, and uh, the big complaint. Um, I know some of you don't watch The Bachelor. You, some of you men rather watch Dancing with the Stars. I understand that, but <clears throat> I don't watch that. I mean, but I heard they're getting up to the stars of the '80s, which is really getting exciting, I'm sure for you. But anyway, um, The Bachelor says everything's okay. You know, he, everything's okay. And the, and the girls were just ragging on him for that last week because everything's not okay. You just don't care about anything. It's not okay. It's not okay. And he's just like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And we think about God that way. Well, God, I, I'm only going only, only to give what, what I want to give because it's all about grace. And God's supposed to say, hey, it's okay. It's okay. God, I'm going to come to worship when I want to come to worship because I'm not leave, living under legalism. You know, I was challenged last week to say 44, 45 weeks out of the year, set a goal. That's just legalism. God, I'm going to go when I want to go because you're a gracious God. And God's supposed to say, ah, it's okay, it's okay. And I'm going to serve the way I want to serve. You know, I, hey, I serve at church. I pass that offering plate every Sunday. Boy, it takes effort. That's service. I serve. That's okay, it's okay. And so everything's supposed to be okay with God. But see, what we're doing is we're looking at grace from only a vertical point of view. We're only saying what God's given to me. And what that is is really presumption on God. It's like a parent coming and saying, hey, look, I'm going to give you some money to start your own business, to start your own career, start your own business. I want you to start your own business. And the, and the, and the guy says, well, I'm going to do what I want to with the money because the money's just going to keep coming in. And it'll be okay with my dad. My dad's just going to say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. I don't know he's really not. Because you're, you're really presuming on his grace. The picture of grace in the Bible is really a beautiful thing. How do we get the power and desire to live the, the word of God and, and living in the will of God? We get it by the grace of God. God gives us the grace. Then we become administrators, managers, stewards, dispensers of the grace of God. And sometimes to ourselves. But certainly to other people. And it comes through giving way beyond the law. Serving way beyond, beyond the law. Coming to church not because, oh, we just have to because of the law. No, because we want to honor God, and we want to know more about God, and we're excited. We're, we're, it's not like, as I said last week, going to see our, maybe some of you going to see your parents, and you think, oh, you know, we, you know I love my parents. We need to go. I know we need to go, but I really don't want to go, and it's not that. No, you, you want to come because the grace of God has overwhelmed you. Now, Paul says, I am a dispenser of this grace of God. He says, by the revelation that was made known to me, the mystery. What mystery? Now, there's about three different mysteries that Paul talks about in different epistles or different letters of the Bible. But this one is all about what's happened in chapter 2. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, referring back to what he said in chapter 2. Which in generation was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. He says, look, I'm coming and I'm preaching the God. I'm not a prisoner of Caesar. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Paul saw himself in a whole different light. Now, let me explain it to you this way. What we value and what we prioritize in our life is what's going to disappoint us. The potential of you being disappointed has, you and I being disappointed, has something to do with what we value. For example, two ladies 
Uh, one is working, we'll say, for uh, Siemens. Another one's working for uh, Lockheed Martin. Both are in the business world. The one working at Lockheed Martin thinks to herself, well, you know, I just love business. I love the planning. I love uh, the camaraderie of everybody and I, everything's going on. And I just love that. But she also likes to sing. It's a hobby. You know, she sings in church sometimes. And she tries out for things, plays sometimes. I mean, she's close to Disney. Why not? And then the other lady at Siemens also is in business, but she's in business to pay the bills. She loves to sing. Not only that, that's her life's dream, life's goal. Every time there's something at Disney, every time there's something American Idol, I mean, whatever it is, she's going to try out for it because that's what she really wants to do. That's, that's her life. That's, her, that's what's on the throne of her life. She's just got to do that. She just consumed with it. Well, both go try out for The Voice, okay? Both get rejected. I tell you this, I venture to say that those two ladies are going to take that disappointment totally different. The one who says, it's my life, singing's my life, is going to be devastated, disappointed. She's going to be saying, God, I go to church, I sing in church, why don't you, why don't you bless me? You know, man, I tithe, God, come on. I mean, you know, I do all these things for you. I serve in the nursery for crying out loud. And I do all that, you know, we go through the same things. You know, God, I've done this. God, I've done that. You know, why don't you bless me? And she's just devastated. She can't even think straight. The lady, on the other hand, that is in business, and that's her main thing, thinks to herself, wow, that was fun. You know, I tried out for the voice. Man, what a great experience. Got to meet some people. And, man, I'm going to do that again. That was a lot of fun. Oh, well, I didn't make it, but that's okay. And she goes back to doing what her life's all about, business. And Paul's saying, look, I'm in prison, and I've been disappointed. And I've gone through some suffering. I've had to work through some things. But I can tell you this. I've come to the place in my life where Jesus is on the throne of my life. I am the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is what has value to me. He is my treasure in this life. And therefore, nothing else can disappoint me but God. And God himself will never disappoint me. I may be disappointed with life. I may be disappointed in the fact that I didn't think he came through for me in this certain way, in this certain way. But I will never be disappointed with God. And he is on the throne. So how do we overcome discouragement? Well, we've got to ask ourselves the question, what is the treasure of our life? But secondly, Paul is involved in something greater than himself. And in verse 6, it says the gospel. And so Paul says because he is participating in God's plan, he need not be discouraged. Paul's steward, he's a steward, he's a manager to the whole church to preach the gospel. Notice what it says. Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. Again, God's generosity which was given to me according to the working of his power. God gave me something special to preach the gospel, to share the gospel. And this word here for ministering and, and according to the grace of God just means something everybody's doing. They're, they're ministering for the cause of Christ. To me, he says, verse 8, the very least of all the saints, very humble here, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles. This word has more to do with heralding or something that we witness rather than standing up and preaching like I'm preaching now. To the Gentiles, the unfathomable riches of Christ, referring back to his original statement in chapter 1, tying it all together. And to bring to light what is the ministration of the mystery which for the ages has been hidden in God who created all things. He said in the Old Testament, it's like this. You got like two mountains, all right? You got the Old Testament, Jesus and Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. As the Old Testament builds up to that, Jesus dies on the cross. Then they look ahead and they see Jesus Christ coming again. He said, What was hidden was the valley in between, the church age. You couldn't see it in the Old Testament. You're looking back here, all you could see was the cross, and up above it, the second coming of Christ. But you couldn't see what was hidden from the ages, and that is. The gospel of Jesus Christ with the Jews and the Gentiles coming together. But the key here is the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is good news. The gospel means that even though we're sinners and separated from God, that God loved us and Jesus Christ died on the cross for us and he rose again on the third day. And he's already talked about this by the grace of God that we are saved, that we could boast and gain our confidence in what God has done for us. And if you've never received Christ into your heart, you need to receive the grace of God before you can give the grace of God. And so you need to receive him this morning, and I encourage you in just a few moments to do that. But notice what he says. 
He says that Jesus Christ and this gospel means all to me. He says, this is my value system. In fact, look back up in verse 21, just a little insight here. In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. He says, this is the presence of God. And we're all glued together. We're cemented together, as I said last week. Brick upon brick, brick upon brick, we're cemented together. What's the cement? What's holding it together? Now, if what's holding you together is your family, your family's going to disappoint you. If what's holding you together is your job and the money that you're making, you're going to be disappointed sooner or later. Even in a church, what holds a church together? Sometimes it's the preaching. Oh, is it the preaching? Oh, it's the music is holding us together. What's holding your small group together? Oh, it's, it's our leader. Wrong answer. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's the fellowship. Well, Bible talks about that and how wonderful that is. And that's all about the church. We talked about that last week. But is that the cement, the glue that holds us together? There's some people here that have fought during a war before. You, you, you fought, and maybe it was way back in World War II, maybe it was Vietnam War, maybe it was uh, Afghanistan, but you fought in a war. And you're thinking to yourself, well, uh, I'm fighting in this war, and you know, here I am, a Florida fan. I'm not, by the way, but I'm, I'm a Florida fan, and this guy over here is an FSU fan. Man, I can't fight next to him. Can't do that. This, this person over here, man, he's a Methodist, for crying out loud. And over here is a Presbyterian. You know, we disagree on too much. Now, let me say this, that you and I, as Christians, we need to agree, to agree on the things that make us Christian. The Trinity of God. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins. He was raised, raised again on the third day. We must receive Jesus Christ in our heart. He is the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through him. We, we need to understand uh, the Bible as an errant word of God. And there's certain things that we all believe that make us Christian. But what's the cement that holds us together when we disagree? Somebody says, well, I don't know. You know, about the, you know I'm not going to you know, do this or do that because I don't agree with everybody the way they serve or, or we got a lot of people that don't serve at all. I don't like that or I don't like the way the, you know, this little money is spent in the budget or I disagree with this little doctrine or that little doctrine or you know, I, I'm, I'm here in politics and somebody else is not over here. And all these things that seem very important to us but they're not the cement that holds us together. When people go out to fight war, what are they doing? Hey, look, I, I'm fighting next to, a, to an Alabama fan, for crying out loud. I'm fighting a, here with, with a Methodist and a Presbyterian and a Catholic, and I'm fighting a war for my country with different races. What, what, is, what is this all about? I can tell you what it's all about. Those people, no matter how they felt about one another, all came together for a cause. There was a cement there, and that cement was to defend the United States of America against tyranny. That was, that's what it was all about. And not only did they come together for that cause, but they felt camaraderie about one another. Some service people will tell you that not since they've even been out of the service in their young 20s have they ever felt that kind of fellowship and camaraderie even in the church. They were together for a purpose. And Paul says, look, we can disagree on some of the peripheral issues, but let me tell you this. The cement that brings us together is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm a part of that. Amen. It's Jesus Christ dying and raised from the dead and us receiving him into our heart. That's what it's all about. That is... It's not about policies, it's not about traditions, it's not about causes, it's not about even the music and denominations and preaching. What bring, brings us together as a church is a cause. And if, if that cause is not bringing you together with others, then you're going to be disappointed. Then you're going to have complaints. You're going, to, you're going to be disillusioned by some things. Always in a church, always. People are going to disappoint you. But if your cause is the gospel, and man, it makes a difference. Let me tell you something. Hey, if I can just come down off the pulpit for just a minute and just be one of you, be part of the church, pastors go through discouragements as well. I was asking a guy not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, in fact, in the ministry, and I said, uh, you seem kind of discouraged. Uh, you're not thinking about quitting, are you? He said, yeah, every Monday. You know, and he kind of laughed, you know. And so uh, pastors get discouraged as well. And so you think to yourself, well, everybody is going through 
checking out their value system and asking ourselves the reason why we're discouraged. But I've discovered when I share the gospel with somebody else, hey, it, it reviews in my mind where I came from, what I'm about. There's a certain power of the Holy Spirit that comes over you when you do that. And I've got an advantage on the rest of you. I can stand up here in the pulpit every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, and preach that gospel, and it makes a difference to me whether it makes a difference to you or not. Paul says, look, don't feel sorry for me. Don't think I'm discouraged. Jesus is on the throne, and I'm still about his mission. I'm still making a difference, dispensing his grace through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then finally, we see a so what. What's that for? Verse 10, we see we can overcome discouragement because we accomplish God's purpose. He says in verse 10, so that. He says, so that there's a reason behind it all that the manifold, the many-colored, the brilliance, wisdom of God might show, might now, rather, be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose. Now notice that. It's in accordance, the church, with the eternal purpose that, we, that he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. He died on the cross for this. In whom we have boldness, that is, public confidence and confident access through faith in him. Now, what's he saying? Man, there's, there's something. You know, he says the principalities, the powers of darkness, the rulers. He says, he's saying this. Basically, whether you're in heaven or hell or on earth, the church is here to do something special. Listen to this. The world through the message of the gospel in the context of the church sees what God is bringing together for them in the future. And so Paul is saying, look, everybody around you, church at Ephesus, is looking at you and saying, hey, wow, could that be for me? Could that be the future? Could that be heaven for me? And now Paul knows there's, there's all kinds of flaws in the church. You know, if you, you're looking for a perfect church, you, you missed it here. And, uh, you know, we were perfect before you walked through the door, but, you know, now, you know, not so much, you know. No, no, none of us are perfect, so we're not a perfect church. And Paul knows that, but nevertheless, he says, look, the world is looking for you for hope. The world, by very existence, is declining. The world is not evolving. The world is, is getting worse. In fact, it's decaying. It's falling apart. You look at war. What, what is that? Countries falling apart. Crime, racism, relationships fall apart. Death, our bodies are falling apart. But it wasn't like that from the beginning. In Genesis 1 and 2, God made man male and female. He made human beings. And the Bible says they were to live there together in fellowship with him. But sin entered the world and ruined everything. And the cross, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is here to cure that sin, to take that sin away. That You and I could see, again, the roof blowing off the house and having access to God. And once the roof is off the house, the walls have to fall. There's nothing to hold them up. And so the walls come tumbling down, and we're together now as a church, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, teaching, witnessing for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're like the window dressing when you go shopping. We're like the coming attractions. You've been to a movie lately? You, well, you go, and you, you know, my, my favorite part is sometimes just watching the coming attractions. Man, they got this, you know, this real manly movie, you know, and they're killing everybody, you know, you know it's just fake, so you don't bother you too much, and, but it's a lot of action. We've got to come back and see that one. We've got to come back and see that one. Why? Because they're showing you the best parts to get you to come in. Window dressing, you've got window shopping, and boy, there's, ladies, there's this outfit that you're just looking for, and there, maybe there's a, a piece of furniture or a lamp or something. Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see what's in this. What, what are they doing? They're, they're doing something to say, hey, look, this is, this is the coming attraction, and that's what we are to the world. We are the coming attraction. That's why the unity of the body is so important. The unity of the body. The Bible talks about it over and over again. Ephesians 4, we'll talk about that even more in just a few weeks. But the unity of the body coming together for a cause that's greater than ourselves. And Paul is saying, don't be discouraged for me. Hey, you know, Jesus is on the throne. He's the one that really matters to me. It's not all this other stuff. I mean, they matter. It, they really do. I care, and I struggle with it, but I keep coming back 
to how precious Jesus is for me. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be also. And Paul says, my treasure, my treasure is in Christ. But also he says, I'm encouraged because I'm still part of all this. I'm still preaching the gospel for those who come. As a matter of fact, if it wasn't for me being in prison, the book of Ephesians, by the way, wouldn't have been written. The book of uh, Philippians wouldn't have been written. Colossians wouldn't be with us because he wrote all these from prison. God still used him. And even the fact that he didn't know that, he didn't know that. He says, I'm part of the body. I'm part of your body. I'm part of the body of Christ that is still preaching and teaching and witnessing for the cause of Christ. And we're making a difference. We're making a difference in this life. We're making the difference. So, does that make suffering worth it? Yeah, sometimes it does. Some of you, maybe we'll just say, have dropped $10,000 on your child's education, but you love your child, so that was kind of worth it. And then on the other hand, you know, it wouldn't be worth $10,000 to say, go on a cruise and drop it on the gambling tables, you know? Think, oh man, what a waste, what a waste. I can't believe I did that. But it was worth suffering $10,000 because of someone you loved. Paul is saying, it's worth it. Wherever God's planned for me, it's worth it. Now, can God use Paul as a discouraged Christian if he had been discouraged? I think God can use anybody. God can use a mule. He did in the Bible. But you know, unfortunately, our discouragement always affects those around us. Verse 13, therefore I ask you not to lose heart. They perceive Paul's suffering three years in prison. They couldn't get it out of their mind. They prayed for him daily. They prayed for him maybe sometimes around the clock. They loved him like a brother, like a father in the ministry. And Paul says, don't be discouraged on my account. But they were. Because I know this, our discouragement affects those around us. That's right. It just does. Even as a pastor going through a few years ago, discouraging times, I felt like that I had to mask it sometimes. Sometimes I was victorious over it. But you know there's just something there until you reach a final place of victory. There's something there that maybe people can't put their finger on that affects those that you love the most. It just affects them. It affects them in a negative way. Paul is saying, don't be discouraged on my account. I don't want you to be affected in a negative way because of what I'm going through. You don't have to be discouraged for me because I'm not discouraged. I'm not. I've overcome that, and you can overcome it as well. And God then can use you in a tremendous way. Folks, what about you today? You can think, well, I, I'm just discouraged. You know, I'm kind of down a lot, and wow, you know, just affecting me. No, it's affecting those that you love the most, those that you come in contact with every single day on a regular basis, things that you can't really mask, and they don't know what's wrong. They, they think you're okay, but they just think, oh, there's just something a little off, even when you mask it, even when you, when you feel like you're, you're, you're living through it. There's just something there that's changed you. And so we need to get over our discouragements, not only for ourselves, but also for others as well. So you're here, here this morning. Your problems are real. I'm not saying they're not. Maybe they're exaggerated, but they're real. The job, the family, the money, school, relationships, lost a boyfriend, lost a girl. All those things are real. They're true. They're just not the whole truth. And God wants to come to your rescue and make the difference in your life. Now, in order for you to be a dispenser of that grace, you've got to receive the grace of God yourself. And if you've never done that, I want to invite you to do that right now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, the quietness of this moment. Right now, by faith, if that's the cry of your heart, God, I, I, I want the victory. I want to be a dispenser of God's grace, and in order to do that, God, I've got to have your grace myself, and I've got to do it through Jesus Christ and what he's done for me on the cross. The gospel, the gospel message. If that's the prayer of your heart, I want to invite you this morning to pray this prayer with me silently as I pray aloud. If God has spoken to your heart today, and whether you're watching here or listening here, watching by TV, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me silently as I pray aloud. And the prayer goes like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. 
Thank you for going to the cross and dying there for my sins. I open up the door of my heart. I ask you to come in. Please forgive me of everything that I've done. Make me the person that you want me to be. In Jesus' name, I pray.